Good morning or afternoon, as the case may be, wherever you are joining us from. Thank you all for joining our meeting. Um, uh, we are just going to, so a few people are still popping into the waiting room, so we're going to just hold off for another minute or two. Uh, we have about 50 people signed up for this meeting, so um, too many to go around and do introductions. I will be introducing our speakers and myself, um, but um, others, if you wouldn't mind just popping into the chat and just saying hi to people and um, what your affiliation is real quick, so people get a sense of who's on the call. Could do that while we're waiting for others to join. All right, we're at five after, and I know people will keep dro dropping in. It's uh, lunchtime here in uh, the central time zone, so maybe people are settling in with, uh, you know, brown bag or whatever they are doing at home in this weird time. Um, so um, thank you all again for joining us. I'm going to share my screen real quick and get us started. find the right okay everybody seeing that okay just a thumbs up yes okay and Chris you're you're gonna keep admitting people as they come in thank you Okay, um, again, welcome to everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, this is uh, the State Smart Transportation Initiative's annual meeting, which we call the Community of Practice. Usually it's in person, obviously not this year, um, as so many others. We've adapted to um, Zoom world. Uh, my name is Eric Sundquist. I'm the director of um, SSTI. I'll introduce our speakers in just a minute. Um, also with me from SSTI is our deputy director, Chris McCahill, who's uh, sort of producing this show and some other staff. Um, we're expecting, if everybody who signs up, who signed up comes in, we're expecting around 50 people this year. So that's an advantage over uh, um, our in-person meetings, which we usually keep pretty small. We usually restrict them to state DOT secretaries or C-suite designates. And this year we've opened our topical sessions like this one to, to others. So. Um, Glad that everybody can be a part of it. Really excited about this one. All, all three, but this one is um, is is great to kick off with. Um, if you're not familiar with SSTI, we're based at the University of Wisconsin. We're also an affiliate of Smart Growth America, and we run this thing called the Community of Practice, um, which is normally around the the DOT CEOs. And as I said, is uh, is adapting to be uh, more open, at least in part this year. Um, to others in the field. Uh, we do a lot of technical assistance and, and research uh, with our state DOTs who participate with us, um, with others. If you're interested in reaching out to us, the website is at the bottom. Um, and we're, we're happy to sometimes do that for uh, on contract. Sometimes we can find um, resources to do that without you having to pay us, but not always. And then we do a lot of general reports and outreach. Uh, we have a blog that I'd send you to, again, ssti.us. You can go there and find all of that. Um, our community of practice this year, as uh, noted, is online. Um, today's session, we're about to begin, but tomorrow we're having our CEO invite-only roundtable. If you're um, from a state DOT and your CEO or somebody from the C-suite would like to attend and hasn't already signed up, um, you can email me, uh, there's info again, the website at the bottom. Um, and then in November, we have two other sessions coming up um, that I'm really excited about too, one on anti-racism and equity, 
and one in on reigning NVMT, one of the sort of new charges for DOTs that used to be. Uh, sometimes we would celebrate growth in VMT because it showed people were using our system. Uh, that's no longer the case. Um, okay, and so a word about um, our format here. Uh, I have booked this for two hours. That's a long time for a Zoom session. Not really expecting it to go that long, but uh, if it does, it just means that people are really interested and we'll, we'll um, go as long as you want up to the two hours. We are recording it. Normally our sessions are sort of um, Chatham House rules where we don't record things and we don't attribute things. Um, we're, loose, we're not really holding to that on this. I am recording it and intending to um, link to it from our website. I'm not sure how many people go to recorded webinars and meetings, but, um, but it'll be there. Um, and we are running it like a meeting. So I, I didn't set this up as a webinar. We're, we're gonna allow people to uh, jump into the chat with questions and thoughts um, or to, to come in like a, a regular meeting. We have, we do have, you know, maybe 50 people. So that might be a bit of a problem, but if you're, if you're of a mind to, um, you know, you're, you have that ability. If that gets out of hand, we'll just have to deal with it and, and mute people or ask people to mute. But um, we are, the hope is that we can have a good kickoff here in the first half hour. Um, with with some presentations that get uh, the juices flowing and then really not just make it a kind of rote Q&A, although that's, you know, certainly questions of our presenters are in order, uh, but we're looking for your thoughts um, and, and as much of a discussion as we can have in this sort of attenuated um, situation that we find ourselves in digitally here. So I think that covers all the housekeeping and ground rules. Um, I wanted to start off uh, our topic. We have, well, I'll again introduce our great speakers here in just a minute, uh, but I wanted to say a few words just to like kind of as a super preamble here. Um, and I'm, our, our December, our, our last session coming up in mid-December is going to feature my good friend, Ellen Greenberg from Caltrans. She's the Deputy Director for Sustainability. And when we were planning that session, it turned out, lo and behold, she'd done some things about uh, COVID and commuting and um, had just presented to the Sacramento um, Council of Governments, the MPO there. And I said, Ellen, you're, we're, we're doing a mind melt, so can I steal a couple slides? And she said, sure. So um, I just wanted to give you three quick slides from her to get this the ball rolling here. Um, and then some a couple things out of my own experience and then we'll, I'll desist and the real, the real stars will take over. So, um, you know, one of the big things that we're looking at, obviously out of COVID and what's gonna happen after COVID, um, you know, some things might go back to normal, but uh, teleworking was already a thing. It was already, you know, the technology was already becoming more common. Obviously we had to ramp up really quickly and get our skills on Zoom and WebEx and Microsoft Teams and whatnot. Uh, you know, much, you know, much more finely honed. Uh, but at this point, people pretty much know to stay off, get off a of mute or get on mute when they're supposed to, and they, we can manage all this stuff, um, at least for the appropriate sort of work. It's not much help if you are a frontline food server, but for the, you know, white collar people who've been involved in this for the last few months, um, it, it's taking what was sort of in a nascent stage and, and pushing it out. So it's, it seems very likely that, um, and we'll come back to this in a minute, that telecommuting is not a just one-off. It's not gonna go away when COVID goes away. Um, so people are looking at this as a in the policy world. And back in the day when um, transportation demand management, TDM was all around reducing peak hour congestion, and to some extent it still is, telecommuting was one of those top line items that we really wanted to get people to do. The federal government has a strong T, um, a TDM policy around telecommuting, for example, to reduce congestion in, in DC. The question is though, as we're thinking about uh, broader policy, which is around system-wide congestion, vehicle miles traveled, emissions, and those sorts of things, is it gonna help us on those? Um, and so as Ellen's slides point out, 
the commute trip is the minority of all trips, uh, only about a quarter and, and less than a third of all the BMT. So um, right away, we're, you know, we, we can't get that excited about telecommuting as a VMT measure just because it's affecting the just this one slice of the pie. And in fact, it's only a, a slice of the slice because um, not everybody, again, can telework. You have to have access to the technology. You have to have a job that's suitable. Your employer has to allow it. Um, and these things have some interesting demographic correlations too. Um, it's, you know, whereas uh, a, a higher income people, Asian and white people tend to be able to telecommute more. Uh, black people don't, Hispanic people don't. Um, so that's, you know, when we're thinking about telecommuting as some kind of um, great policy to embrace, we have to realize that it is uh, not gonna affect everybody all equally and, and maybe not all as many people as we think it, it might. And then finally, what about all the sort of second order and rebound effects um, that might come of it? Let's say we do have a substantial share of commuters who um, resort to telecommuting on a long-term basis, um, which is, is quite likely here. Um, a lot of things happen. We delink a lot of trips, a lot of dropping things off and picking stuff up on the way to and from work go away and those become maybe discrete trips. Um, we are able to get rid of you know, our commuting time and put it into other time, which might be spent in driving, driving somewhere else. We might move further away from home or from work. Uh, so the less frequent commute trips end up being longer, even the less frequent and maybe a wash. And those residential locations might be further away from other activity centers, making other sorts of trips longer. Um, we might end up, you know, third places such as cafes and co-working might become more important, important which is kind of an interesting outcome that may or may not affect uh, BMT. Uh, we, some studies have shown that if, if I don't have to commute anymore and, uh, you know, my car is now available, the teenager in my house now has access to a car, somebody else who didn't have access to a car does, and there's new VMT from that. And when we stop doing these hub and spoke trips, well, well that might be great for, um, you know, VMT and congestion on those hub and spoke roads. It's not just driving that goes down, it's also transit and lower fare box revenue is going to impact our ability to provide transit for people who still need it. So we can't just take the trips out of the system that are replaced by teleworking and zero them out. Um, there's going to be a, a lot of things that happen, and we've blogged a fair amount of, about this even before um, COVID hit. So um, it's, it's not clear if telework is a net improvement on VMT or in that, you know, might actually be a, a bad thing for VMT. And then there's a whole host of other impacts if you're into the GHD world about building energy that we probably aren't going to get into, but those are also, um, you know, another set of questions. If I'm at home, do I use the, um, my air conditioning more um, or do, you know, do buildings get smaller, do office buildings get smaller and we get a benefit from that? So we're not, not really gonna focus on that today, but it's worth thinking about. Pivoting then to the other big topic here on land use. I am on the Madison Plan Commission we've had. We're seeing some of the um, effects that were again, sort of at a long time coming, but now accelerated and put in high relief by what's going on in COVID. And that's not only telework, but also delivery services uh, and uh, TNCs and things like that. This is a project that um, came up last summer that um, as a, a fan of infill housing, you know, you would, you know, as many of us are, and I definitely am, I would really love. It was low parking footprint. It was in our highest um, transit supported neighborhood. Uh, lots, you could walk to almost everything. A walk score probably a hundred, if not, you know, maybe 95 or something. Um, so lots to love. One of the reasons it got turned down, um, and there were, it wasn't just this, but this a major one was that concern about delivery services. 
where would the Uber, Uber Eats person park and run into this building since um, the people wouldn't be driving to the store on their own? Uh, the neighbors objected to that. And this otherwise, to my mind, really great building um, was, was turned down. I hope it comes back, but um, so far it has not. Uh, in a little bit more suburban part of the city, there is an old strip mall that is more or less empty, um, and but much beloved by the neighbors. And when this development came along with some retail on the bottom floor, um, they argued that that wasn't enough retail in the area, that it would only become sort of high-end boutique -y, stuff or food and not the hardware store or going back even further, the Ben Franklin that they remembered was in this strip mall from years past. And again, um, I voted for this, strongly supported it, but it was turned down on that basis. So the whole question about the viability of um, retail and just how much we can expect, and we've worked for so long to have first floor retail, um, and that's in our city, that's really become a struggle to, to lease. So developers are unwilling to provide, you know, thousands of square feet or, or tens of thousands of square feet of retail in these bottom floors. So I think Jair will help us a lot with his, his views on this. And then finally, on the upside here in Madison, in this kind of shifting uh, environment that we're in, we had, this was a 1960s era mall that you know, when it came in, helped kill off our downtown, uh, frankly, but became kind of a pretty big regional mall, um, had been declining over the years. And finally, the, it was purchased in, um, you know, the last tenant, I don't know when the last tenant left, it was a, had gone down to sort of the, the uh, TJ Maxx and uh, nail salon level without a, a big anchor or much else going on there. Finally went out of business and it's now being redeveloped into a pretty good mixed use center that might be like what we have coming. Um, lots of uh, residential, including affordable, some employment uses. And as far as retail goes, a big grocery store. And it's one of those mega grocery stores that has a sit down eating area and a Starbucks and stuff in it and a pharmacy. So uh, maintained the walk score pretty well. Um, and there are other things in the area. It's also across the street from one of our transit transfer points, so very well served by transit. So there's, that's maybe an example of um, a happy ending in all of this transformation. Getting, and I, I, this is where I'm gonna desist and turn it over to our speakers. Um, again, just to suggest that these changes are not just COVID year and once 2020 or the vaccine comes along, uh, 2020 ends or whatever our period of troubles is and uh, things are going to snap back. Our MPO did a, a survey, and I, I, I don't think the um, sampling universe was completely um, uh, unbiased. It was, uh, it was a volunteer survey through the MPO and its partners, the business community surveyed their members. So it wasn't weighted for blue collar, white collar demographics or anything like that. But it was a large uh, a, a response in the thousands. And they found among that uh, sample universe that 78% of workers had not worked from home before pre-COVID, but 80%, just about the same number, had been working from home uh, through the time the survey was done uh, and when it was cut off in the summer, um, at least one day a week. And they really liked it. I mean, not everybody wanted to do it all the time, but some did. Um, and the managers, even in places where there was no work from home going on before, are anticipating a lot more going on, including over a quarter saying that they expect a lot of people to be working nearly full full time from home. So that speaks to what's happening with the office market, what happens to the areas around our office and activity centers, what happens to our commuting patterns. Um, point being, um, things are changing and we will now try to figure out how, how and what to do about it. So two great speakers, Laura Schul, who's been a friend of SSTI for a long time, founded Streetlight Data, um, one of the leading um, data firms that takes uh, connected vehicles and, and cell phone traces and gives us good new insight, empirical insight on what um, people are doing, how they're traveling. 
and Jair Lynch, president of Jair Lynch Real Estate Partners, who I've only gotten to know recently, but also um, you know a fantastic partner in through through um, our work with Smart Growth America. He is president of Locus, which is um, a smart growth oriented, sustainability oriented um, um, organization around the real estate industry and, and land use. So um, two fantastic speakers and I have taken more than enough time from them. So I will stop now and um, turn it over to, to Laura. Thanks, sir. All right. I think you have to give me the power to share my screen as a participant. Nope, I just have to stop sharing, which this will stop moving. Okay, now you should be good to go. Still wants you to enable me. Oh. All right. Should be able to. Oh, here we go. Okay, sorry, it was deep. All right. So, do we have a slideshow yet? Nope, we have to switch the screen. Screen share. There we go. All right. Can everybody see it? Great. So thanks for allowing me to speak to this great group. Uh, like Eric said, I've been an SSTI fan for a long time now. So uh, at Streetlight Data, we process uh, trillions of mobile pings from connected cars, smartphones, connected trucks. We blend that data with a lot of other more conventional sources like um, embedded sensors in the road and bike sensors and uh, the census and road network data, all to create accurate, standardized, normalized, and aggregated analytics that describe the movements of large groups so that we don't track any individual. So we work with several hundred different agencies across the US who are uh, subscribers to our software and they can pull out analytics about you know, whatever they like. Um, but I took advantage of the fact that I have an account that allows me to analyze anything. And Streetlight, since COVID has started, has been analyzing um, some nationwide and regional trends that we think are shedding light on how travel behavior has shifted during the crisis. I don't wanna say we know how to predict what comes next because I think we've all realized no one knows what's coming next. Um, but the trends are still informative, um, and I think, to steal my own thunder, the message we want to highlight here is that constant updates of analytics are going to be what is required for agencies and those related to transportation to succeed. Because the notion that surveys done five years ago can be used for five years is now sort of patently insane. So this is a quick look at nationwide VMT. The dark blue line is 2020. We measure VMT for the nation every single day. And the yellow line is the comparable day in 2019. So what you can see is basically there was a huge dip at the beginning of the crisis and then recovery. And now we've hit steady state. And it is true that our steady state is similar in terms of VMT to where we were in February, right before the crisis. Um, but it is also true that July, August, September last year were 13-ish percent higher than they are this year. So we're down on a month-by-month -month basis, but we're seeing about the same number of VMT on a typical day that we were in February before the crisis. And this spike here with its parallel right here is Labor Day weekend. Um, now, as has been reported on a lot, there's clear divide in the rural versus urban. Rural fell less and has recovered faster. That's the dark blue line. Um, than urban, which shouldn't be a shock to anybody. Um, and just as an example, uh, we published some adjacent counties, Goshen, for example, in Wyoming, which is very rural, and Laramie, which has more of the town centers. And you can see, even though they're perfectly adjacent, a clear division in the behavior there. The Wyoming being more rural overall, uh, especially even at the beginning of the crisis, was down a lot less in the US. And we see that pattern very consistently in the rural urban divide. And some of the most interesting things we'll talk about in a minute talk about when you're getting suburban. We also see a clear con co continuation of VMT for essential workers, which again, shouldn't be a shock to anyone. So we analyze different neighborhoods 
in New York City. Um, and there was only one neighborhood that in April had travel up compared to before the crisis. Um, and that's up here, I think it's called Mount Hope. And then we mapped the destinations, the commute destinations of where all these people who were still traveling still worked. And it's all very clearly essential workers. So you've got essential workers from the sort of less connected, more outlying areas of greater Long Island who are traveling into the big medical cores of New York City to continue that work. And that analysis was very helpful uh, for those who were trying to figure out which transit lines to keep running and how to keep essential services going during this extreme crisis. So urban traveling less, unless you're an essential worker, and rural not having as much of an impact. Now, when we published, started publishing this data saying VMT was back to pre-COVID levels, we got a bunch of emails saying, you're insane, all the traffic, there's no congestion, something's wrong with your data, even from some of our customers. We said, you know, it's not just Streetlight saying VMT is back to February levels, you know, FHWA says that all the other data providers who analyze these things are saying it. Um, what's interesting is we're seeing this shift. So again, here is uh, Metro Chicago. The yellow line shows you the distribution of VMT across a typical weekday. And the blue line shows you distribution in August 2020. And what you see is essentially the morning peak has gotten shaved down. And that travel is more evenly distributed through mid-morning through mid-afternoon. So we've got just a very classic shift in the load curve. And that is why we all know that congestion is very uh, marginal, right? Just a few extra cars saved can eliminate your traffic jams. That is what we're seeing here in Chicago. And we see it again and again and again in all the metro areas. So we've got LA, New York, San Francisco, especially New York and DC, all exhibiting that same new load curve for when people are spending those VMTs. What we're also seeing is it's not just that the time is shifting, it's where the trips are starting is shifting. Um, so again, we're back in Chicago. These yellow grids are areas where, again, in a year-on-year -year comparison, more trips are starting than before. So what this really shows us is that VMT in the Chicago metro area has shifted towards these outlying regions, and we have a converse graph. You see it shifting away from the dense Chicago downtown. So again, even though there's the same VMT, we've not just redistributed in time, we've redistributed in space, and as a result, we have less congestion. Now, what both these redistribution trends mean is that we can increase VMT without a commensurate rise in congestion. And from some people's perspective, that's great because we're like distributing our assets across our infrastructure more evenly. And we had all these roads anyway, so now we can use them. But from other people's perspective, like perhaps mine, this could be a troubling trend because I think congestion is one of the biggest dampers on driving more. It's one of the reasons people take transit, one of the reasons people like to live closer to their work and where they like to do things. So if there's less congestion but more driving, I'm not totally thrilled with that as a trend. Okay, another trend that got widely reported on is how everybody was biking in urban areas. Streetlight also analyzed bike trends as it has been doing it nationwide ever since uh, COVID started. But what we found is counter to a lot of the media storylines, summer biking was actually down in most major metros. So yellow dots, are where we have a decrease in biking activity. Biking was going up in a lot of what we would call the second and third tier cities in terms of size and density. So the size of the circle is the population, at least the biggest, um, and the color of the dot, if it's blue, the darker blue, the more biking increased um, year on year for the summer months. So, Biking up in the smaller tier, less dense cities is great, but nobody, again, nobody believed us when we said, hey, biking's actually down in places like New York and LA proper. And the reason is that biking is down because everything is so down, like people are not living there right now, nobody's going anywhere. Biking is just down because everything, all activity is down. But, and this is New York City metro area, sorry, my heading got chopped off. Biking is down, blue, less than driving is down. So even though biking has stayed a little down through the summer months when the lockdown was really intense in New York, it was actually taking a slightly larger share of the mode split pie because everything was so diminished there, including the entire population of New York City. So that's still a good trend, but it was a little counterintuitive. 
So when I think about the future and what we do in terms of recovery for land use and VMT, I think the goal is how do we recover without, how do we recover economically without the same CO2 emissions from the transportation sector? And what that means is we need to decouple economic growth from VMT growth. And we're doing actually pretty well. So this shows the reduction in nationwide uh, VMT in the black bars. And we also see uh, IHS's estimate of monthly GDP. So in each month, March, April, May, I'm comparing that month in 2020 to 2019. And what we see is that VMT is still, like I said, nationwide holding steady at about a 12 to 13% decrease, but the real GDP has recovered more. So we do see a bit of a decoupling, which I like as a trend. Don't know if it'll hold going forward, but I think it's a good sign. So when we talk about what's next, um, and Eric, I think we're in alignment with what really matters if our goal is to recover economically without recovering all those CO2 emissions from transportation. First and foremost, what worries me is if people move and buy a home or sign a long-term lease, the relative density of their before and after homes, before and after the crisis homes, will affect their VMT potentially for decades. And what we see and are starting to analyze at Streetlight, we hope to publish a report in about a month, is a massive outmigration from more dense blocks to less dense blocks. It could be moving to the suburbs of the same metro area, or often it's moving from a metro area like New York to a less dense area where you maybe can afford a house with a yard, like, you know, Philly, something like this. So to me, the most important thing we need to pay attention to as transportation professionals interested in sustainability is what does it mean if all of a sudden people move, millions of people move, and are all we are redistributed in less dense cores? That to me is the scariest thing. The next most important thing we need to work on um, is VMT reduction by trying to contain, continue this work from home trend, which is really good for VMT and congestion for those who can do it, and a sustained rise in the delivery economy. Now I know with delivery and with work from home, there's a good way and a bad way in terms of carbon impact, those can unroll. So we just need to be attentive to try to maximize the good. Um, also, I think what has become very clear is the underinvestment in transit and other transportation and land use and housing development options for essential workers, who unfortunately tend to be lower income workers, and really thinking about what that means when we have hospital development, school development, things like that. And I think the third most important thing um, is that we all work with our transit systems to survive, not just to come back the way they were, because it wasn't all that financially sustainable in the first place, but to evolve um, and to take advantage of how much people are enjoying reclaimed street spaces to continue that, you know, basically almost free magical expansion of the real estate available in downtown environments. Uh, and I also think that's important for encouraging people to move back to our super dense environments like downtown San Francisco, downtown New York, et cetera. So this is my list of what really matters. Um, but the most important thing that matters, as I said before, and I know I'm biased because I've always been into the data, is uh, we need to measure what's going on every day, every month. We can't rely on making decisions based on surveys or even behavioral models that were developed before because we are in a state of constant flux. And luckily, this is happening at a time where data is available at a scale that was not even remotely thinkable five or 10 years ago. So that's it. Um, and a lot of the trends I showed you, you can download for free in our COVID transportation trends ebook, which you can download here. Great, thank you so much, Laura. I think we'll hold questions um, until after Jair has a chance to speak. So um, Jair, let's pass it over to you. Great, uh, thanks so much, Laura. That was just uh, fabulous. I am such a nerd about data and feel like it's very important in terms of leading us. We're often uh, looking at lagging indicators versus leading indicators, and I hope that we, uh, we can be better at that. So I'm just gonna have some opening remarks um, about uh, who I am and what I think are also some of the key trends that we need to be thinking about um, coming out of, uh, or going through this rough patch and, and coming out of it over a long term. Um, you know, first of all, um, you know, I'm the President and CEO of Jair Lynch Real Estate Partners. Um, we are an investor developer in the Mid-Atlantic region. Um, we have about $2 billion of assets under management, and we 
actually are unique in the sense that we uh, we play in multiple sandboxes in the sense that we do institutional investments um, of office retail and uh, residential, um, but we also are on the front lines of affordable housing as well as producing neighborhood assets in order to uh, allow neighborhoods to, to thrive and flourish. That's my day job. Uh, my my uh, volunteer job is to work with Smart Growth America and specifically the Locus organization, which is a, a cluster of real estate professionals, um, uh, practitioners, and uh, the associated government officials that are that that work uh, adjacent to the real estate space to make sure that they're promote we're, we're promoting policies that support. Um, uh, uh, walkable urban places that happen throughout the region, both in cities and in rural towns, uh, to make sure that we are maximizing uh, the benefit for uh, the quality of life of folks who live in those places. Um, and so through that, um, I'm going to talk about a very simple kind of model uh, of which I think that transportation professionals are part of an ecosystem of how real estate affects uh, place and can also affect services. And it really starts with just this basic uh, thesis that there is typically public investment um, into place. Um, and that can be uh, through a variety of means. It could be in through land use, it could be through transportation improvements, it could be through schools. But that public investment into place is then um, followed by private investment that then hopefully increases a tax base at a state and local level that then allows for the, uh, the, the governments to then uh, dedicate dollars. So invest, harvest, dedicate is really what we talk about. And when there's production, uh, when there's an active flywheel happening, that ecosystem works very well. Um, what we have seen uh, when the policy components don't work well, that usually results in a lack of investment, which then creates the spiral downward that we've seen um, in, in several cities um, uh, in the 70s and 80s, including New York that went bankrupt and Washington DC that was under a control board and several others uh, in the 90s. Uh, and so we are constantly thinking about what are the ways in which policy on the front end can incentivize um, investment that then allows the flywheel to go through. And, and just to give some order of magnitude, um, every single year in the United States, there's about $80 billion of new equity that's raised for real estate every single year. And that $80 billion is then leveraged with debt and produces you know, close to half a billion, I mean, sorry, $500 billion worth of investment. That's happening throughout the system every single year. And, and those investors are making decisions of where to invest based on the policies, procedures, and values of different, of different locations. And that kind of ecosystem is very important to recognize that there's capital available, but if, if, the, if the infrastructure is not there, people will go to a different location. Um, and so when we talk about place, we actually think about it in terms of five stages. Um, and uh, one of the folks that works with Locus uh, Chris Leinberger um, uh, started to um, institutionalize this, this thought process um, when he was over at Brookings, when he thought, when he said basically regionally significant places that invest in transportation schools and other infrastructure uh, can really start to grow exponentially over the places that don't. Um, and so I, I always think of them as five stages and um, there are lots of, uh, lots of uh, data components that go into what these, each one of these places are. But you know, you know it when you see it. Um, it the, the neighborhoods that are distressed, that have uh, poor, uh, poor uh, transportation infrastructure, that have uh, schools that aren't functioning well, that's a stage one neighborhood. Uh, the neighborhoods uh, that are starting to get some public investment, whether it is in uh, transportation, whether it's in other components, the stage two neighborhoods are starting to get some momentum. And stage three, stage four, and stage five is typically when you're getting private investment to kind of work. That's when the, the ecosystem is functioning properly. Um, and so you can see in different parts of different cities, um, 
certain neighborhoods will be stage three and four. They're getting investment that, that the flywheel's working. They're taking the tax proceeds that come from that. They're investing them back in stage one and stage two neighborhoods so that they too can, can also uh, get on the flywheel and start to work kind of on its own. And, but what we're finding is when you move through those different stages, you start to see different behaviors across different asset classes. So in stage two and stage three neighborhoods, where there may be density and there may be some disposable income, retail starts to move. It may not be the retail that you're looking for in the sense that it is um, a transit, I'm uh, sorry, it's not transit oriented, but it is more uh, uh, commuter based uh, and it's dependent on vehicles um, and car traffic in order to do that. Once you start moving into stage three and stage four neighborhoods where the scale is there, then you start recognizing that most of that consumer behavior that can happen as a result of, of, of commuter lines, as a result of metros, as a result of walking traffic. And that's when retail starts to function properly. The same thing in housing and the others, all of these things start to feed on over each other. That's why central business districts with office started to work because of the adjacencies of other office and retail that goes along with it. But right now in the middle of COVID, with a lot of these downtowns um, essentially um, becoming ghost towns, we have to act, act, actively ask ourselves, what have we built and will it be able to be sustainable? And there are you know, thousands and thousands of businesses, especially retail businesses that are suffering now because they, had de they depended on the, the uh, tr foot traffic, they depended on the vehicles travel um, in order to be able to, uh, to meet their business plans. And as we decelerated our, 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 um, our economy, uh, we're starting to see some of that carnage. But in the midst of all of that, we're, the developers are gonna have to think about what are we gonna be programming for the future? And I have to tell you that, that the basics that are, that are embedded in our cities and our rural towns in terms of uh, long-term infrastructure is really what we're, we're uh, as a guiding post for, for future development. Yes, we're gonna change the chassis of apartment buildings. Yes, we may change the chassis of, of, of an office building. Yes, we may be able to, we may have to get more outdoor space for, um, uh, for retail. But in each one of those cases, there's still gonna be a general demand if there's job growth, if there's a baseline economy that's working, an ecosystem that's working, we're still gonna be, we're still going to, the real estate community is still gonna to look to invest as an overall uh, as component of alternatives inside of the entire portfolio. And some of those things are gonna be very tangible. So for instance, are we going to be, uh, have big, large movie rooms in our apartment buildings? Or are we gonna have instead six or seven co-working cubes that allow people to telework from home. Yes, the amenities and components are gonna change slightly. In our office buildings, are we going to rethink the way the approach happens at the lobby or some of the outdoor spaces um, that may be on the rooftop? Yes, some of that will change, but the underlying value in the real estate is still gonna be there. I tell you, the one that's really gonna get the most disruption is the large box retail components. I think that the, the increase in, in internet consumption um, and online um, e-commerce is, is going to increase at a rapid pace. And that is really gonna be put a death nail into a lot of the large retailers. But we've known we've had this problem for a long time. Um, there are 17, 18 square feet per person of retail in this country, while in Europe it's about seven. Um, we've been over retail for a long time. And, and that's one of the reasons that um, e-commerce has worked um, so well here because they were able to create the disruption. But real estate will be resilient in the sense that they will reimagine um, what these what these large format malls will, will be and what they what they uh, how they'll be able to serve demand in the future. So I'll, I'll I'll just finish up by saying that and open up for questions is that we shouldn't abandon our base the basics. Um, we have proven out over the last 25 years that transit rich locations. Um, create the most regional impact um, and that we shouldn't let uh, the distribution of cars of, of, v, of VMT or the, uh, the fact that, that, that downtowns um, have changed, changed in terms of occupancy over the last six months or so. Um, we shouldn't, that shouldn't change the long-term outlook towards um, uh, places um, and we really should continue to think about creating smart 
um, um, ecosystems that are good for the environment, good for people, and allows for the transfer of equity more um, uh, to be more distributed more evenly across our populations um, in, the, in the country. So I'll leave it at that and, and open up for any questions. Great, thank you to Jair and to Laura. Um, I see a little action in the chat. Please don't be shy. If you want to, if you have a thought or a question, you can throw it in there. Um, you can also unmute and, and jump in. Um, I, I'll just use moderator's prerogative, um, jumping off of um, Jair's, one of his closing thoughts there about the decline in big box retail and, and brick and mortar retail uh, in, you know, in general. Um, and Laura's finding about all the additional BMT that we're seeing um, in the more outlying, outlying areas. If those people aren't going out to shop and restaurants are pretty much closed down, Laura, do we know where they're going? Where, where are these trips going to? And like, what, can you characterize them? Like who's making them and like, what is it? Anything you can tell us about that? Yeah, we've done some sort of neighborhood specific things. Um, I mean, people still may be going to the restaurant to pick up the food. Okay. Um, and in a lot of parts of the U.S., uh, that has reopened. I mean, our, our analytics were looking at it, you know, as of a couple weeks ago. So in a lot of the U.S., some restaurants have partially reopened. And I had a very odd conversation for me with someone from Louisiana who said he was, he was on the phone and he was picking up donuts on his way to the office for the staff. And I was like, wow, that. So I think, I think a little bit, there's just a lot of regional variation. But, I mean, we see people going to the park. We see people, I mean, the, the, the spike of activity at trailheads is one of the most notable things of the summer. Um, and the other thing is, I think what we forget about VMT is, even if you're, I'll use the restaurant example again, even if you're going to the restaurant for two minutes to pick up and not having the whole activity, your VMT is still the same. Like, even if you go to the office just to, just to print 10 pages because you don't have as nice a printer at home, you still went to the office once. So... I think the activities may be taking less time, but doesn't mean the VMTR. We also saw a ton of um, trips in the summer, sort of road trips to you know, go camping and things like that uh, in lieu of more airborne summer adventures. That's right. Uh, two points that I think everyone should know. I, I love watching the, the, the TSA numbers every week and how we were down at, you know, four or 500,000 uh, uh, trips in April and May, it's sl slowly climbing, but I don't think it's tripped a million. And we're typically at two, two and a half million uh, trips per week. And so that that's to me is in indicative that we're putting more pressure kind of uh, at ground level because people are using their cars instead of, instead of jumping on planes because there's a lack of confidence um, there. Um, the other anecdotal piece that I'll, I'll offer is I, I remember <laughs> trying to buy a Wendy's franchisee um, that had a, um, uh, an outlet um, on a major thoroughfare. But uh, in 1999, there was a new metro station that opened up about two blocks away from them. Um, and so we thought you know, within five or six years that his sales would have plummeted. Um, and he said, by no means, it's because the commuter traffic and my drive-through that has made it convenient for everyone, 40% of my sales still are still you know, through my drive-through. Um, and so I'm not willing to give that up for you to redevelop into something more sustainable, more green, more transit-oriented. Um, and, and to this day, he has kept that, that drive-through in place. So I think in, uh, on major thoroughfares, in suburban locations, you're absolutely going to get um, uh, a lot of VMT during COVID because they're doing those two minute pickups and you can see it in the national advertising, um, you know, pick, pick your, 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 your largest retail chain, or, sorry, food, food and beverage uh, outlets like Domino's who have, have moved to, well, if you don't want us to deliver, we'll do curbside, curbside pickup. Um, and so you can come to our store uh, and we'll deliver the food outside and you don't even have to come in the door. So remember retail is all about friction. Um, and where there's, there's a, a lack of friction, you'll, you'll get opportunity. And the question is, is that, is that good for overall uh, the environment and everything else because we've eliminated that friction and still incentivize people to, to make those small, short BMTs. Great, that's super helpful. Um, I see a discussion in the chat. 
uh, started by Beth Osborne from Smart Growth America, um, but with um, Laura and Kate Gordon weighing in too. Did you all solve that in the chat or is that something that we should talk about a little bit? It's about whether we're really seeing a move to the exurbs or out of the density into less density or, or not. Beth, do you wanna um, address that a little bit more or are you, you satisfied with what's in the chat? Yeah, I'm really looking forward to uh, the report that Laura is talking about releasing and just right off the bat, what she said is, uh, is much more interesting than what I've read about to date because it's looking at particular uh, blocks and the changes in density, which is way more complex and uh, a more interesting story than uh, kind of the, the, the way the press has been covering it of people displaying the city. Um, I, I always get a little uncomfortable with um, the term suburb because it doesn't really have any meaning. Um, so I, I, I'm very interested to see what Laura has. I'm also interested to see um, the extent of this because I, I'm, I'm kind of awash in the absolutes of the conversation. Everybody's doing all kinds of things that is not actually being done by everyone. So I'm going to be interested to see the extent um, and, uh, and who is doing it. Uh, Kate's comment uh, left me... Um, uh, stunned and not surprised, but uh, wow, uh, I'm sure that the, those folks are getting way more press than maybe they deserve. They are, but I will say as someone who employs a lot of rich techies in San Francisco, several of them are working from their very expensive oh, yeah. Tahoe homes. Right. Well, but well, I agree, every time we've analyzed something often in response to a press article, the trend is always true and it's 10%. Or 5%, it's not everyone. I agree with your summary of media coverage of transportation right now. Right, I, I, I like to go to the data that, that, is, um, that is more you know, tried and true over time. I know in the Washington DC region, um, it, it, there's been land use policies and other things that have affected the ecosystem since 1968 um, that have affected the overall production of housing and other things that have increased pricing that has all kinds of other ripple effects inside the ecosystem. To me, that's going to be much more telling than the five people um, that start to utilize their second homes. Um, so we can go back to Brown versus Board of Education or many other kind of key policy places versus pandemic issues um, in which we've we've created a problem in which we don't have enough housing in order to be able to house everyone in, in, to, to, and they have a good quality of life. Uh, you know, right now in, in the Council of Governments in the Washington DC area said that we, we actually need, we're, we're likely gonna produce about 250,000 units of housing and we, we, we need somewhere like three and a quarter. I mean, that's pretty significant, yeah. um, you know, underperformance. And that's, that's often because of something's wrong inside the ecosystem uh, in terms of being able to produce that. Yeah, Jair, you know, sitting on the literal meridian of Washington, D.C. right now, I'm, I, I'm waiting for that exodus that takes away some of the price pressures in D.C., but I'm only seeing prices escalate. So it, uh, we just might be an unusual bubble, but that's one of the things I'm trying to figure out from all these readings and all these studies and that's why I think what Laura uh, uh, can share will be very helpful. Mm -hmm. One quick thing, Eric, um, and it's nice to see you, uh, is um, uh, also I think that the Bloomberg article and the Zillow data is interesting and, and uh, folks on my team were like, look, it's not that widespread, but just to put a point on why what San Francisco happens in San Francisco really matters to us in California, we're 40% of our general fund and our budget comes from our top 1% of income earners in the state. We have a very progressive tax system. So when people move either, when people move out of San Francisco, their tax base tanks. And when people move out of the state, our tax base tanks. And so it's really actually a big deal to look at what happens in San Francisco. It's a big part of our budget um, and, uh, and super meaningful to us. So I would say it's, it's an outsized issue here. Good, thanks for that. Um, there's a question in the chat from Kay. Kay Kelly, do you want to unmute yourself and, and just go ahead and ask it for Jair? Sure. Um, so I think um, with all of the businesses kind of hopefully reevaluating their need for physical space for office workers, um, what's going to happen to all of that 
commercial real estate in really kind of valuable areas, downtown cores, close to jobs, close to places where a lot of those low income workers are commuting to from really long distances away because of, you know, affordable housing challenges, which we heard in the earlier presentations. What's, what's the conversation on that front and what would it take to repurpose, you know, uh, an office building to, to house families? Right. So um, I want to be very optimistic, um, but I, I need to lay out some of the facts. Right. And so um, the reality is, unless you are in a, in a, let's call it stage two place, as it relates to the value of office buildings, even a building dark for three years is more valuable than converting it to housing, let alone affordable housing. Um, and it's, it's, it's the, the rust bed cities who are stuck in stage two and stage three in which this conversation can happen, but high cost, you know, stage three, stage four, kind of, in kind of regional areas like Washington, DC, others, you're just not going to get the conversion. Um, because it, at that point it's, it's, it's not worth it. And often, uh, uh, you don't have single use buildings in, in central business districts. You often have multi-use buildings. And as a result of that, you, not all leases are lined up. So the chances of you actually having a fully vacant building than a 30% vacant building is highly unlikely. And therefore it still has the highest and best use is still to keep it office um, than to try to convert it. Um, and I have to tell you from, from converting um, a, uh, a hotel into multifamily, um, we, we spent as much as we would have spent on new construction um, because of the way you had to twist and turn the building in order to make it, um, to make it uh, you know, uh, uh, apartments. You know, the plumbing stack wasn't in the right place, so you ripped it all out and put a new plumbing stack in. The windows didn't quite, you know, uh, end up where you wanted them, so you started ripping the skin off. The rooftop couldn't support the rooftop amenities that you wanted to do, so you, you ended up beefing up. So you might as well have rebuilt the building. Um, and so I do think that, um, that in certain places that you'll be able to have some residual value we definitely took away some risks. We definitely didn't have to rebuild parking. So there's some green factors that we really liked about the conversion, but it is not a widespread trend that you're gonna be able to use in every single location. Great, thank you. Um, pause for a second and see if anybody else would like to jump in. Just unmute yourself or chat, whichever you prefer. I can uh, jump in a little bit here for a second. Um, I've been wondering, listening to this, I mean, it sounds like in some ways things might not change as much as we're thinking they might, in some ways they will. And for transportation agencies that are basically used to relying on, on um, land use forecasts and peak period congestion and our making most of their decisions around these assumptions. Um, what, like in this moment right now, ought to, to be paused or, you know, reassessed and, and what keeps, keeps plugging on? I, I can start. I, I will tell you there's nothing better than the uh, transportation agencies and our transportation departments getting more aligned with the the Office of Planning's or equivalent um, in, in a city because the land use patterns, the land use decisions, the comprehensive plans, the ability to get uh, production going um, is, and the alignment of, of goals between the two is the best thing that can happen right now. Um, I, I have told uh, many of regional uh, politicians uh, in the area to say, you know, you may, be blessed with a lot of economic activity and cranes that are in the air today, but those were decisions and equity allocated three to four years ago. Um, and so when, when there's a stop in economic activity, you, you think that you feel the pain because you're watching retail businesses go out of business today. The real pain is when you have a lack of, of overall economic activity two, three years from now. And so that alignment uh, between uh, planning agencies that will allow for 
the ecosystem to actually be functioning um, is really important. And like I said, it's, sept it's October now, and there's still going to be $80 billion of equity that's going to be raised this year, same level as last year. So as long as the fundamentals are in place in, in a jurisdiction, as long as these agencies are thinking uh, uh, collaboratively, then you'll get the, the, the investment that helps to expand the tax base um, in the future that then can be dedicated uh, to, for service for all. I think Jair is totally right in the long term, Chris. I think in the short term, you know, I always say the most important transportation technology is paint and just simple changes to take assets we have and use them in different ways. All you got to do is like paint a part of your sidewalk, just a little box green and be like, this is scooter parking. And then all of a sudden that whole insane debate about scooters in the streets can be right. shut down mostly. Um, so I think that's still true. And one of the things that I've really loved in the crisis is watching how when people decide it's an emergency, how quickly we can just very simply rezone existing assets. We rezone streets to slow streets. We rezone some streets to parks. We rezone parking spaces to restaurants. And uh, so a lot of apartment buildings who just put up a cone and said, everyone is getting Uber Eats. These two are Uber Eats places now. It's just not that expensive. And my hope is that we can learn from that and especially citizens can learn from that and see, oh, that made things a lot better and do things like say, one space in front of every multi-unit dwelling is purple space and purple space means pick up and drop off of passengers and goods, right? Commercial loading zones are not rocket science. We can just call them something a little zippier and add a little different color paint. So that's what I, I hope to see as the sort of silver lining in terms of planning activity and the way citizens think about planning and the way we think about the pace of planning and the way we think about doing something as a draft and then changing it if it doesn't work. That's been really exciting too. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, you know, planning and comprehensive plans need to, to shrink from 10 year activities to, to essentially 10 month activities. We're proving that every single day where they adapt, the, the ability to adapt is happening all the time and it doesn't have to go on forever. There can be a way to come back. Um, we were very fortunate to be able to get a middle income housing program going in DC. And it was because we, we broke it down to a very simple invest, harvest, dedicate. And if the district, in the district, it was Washington DC, if you invest $4 million today, uh, and not even today, if you actually commit to $4 million of investment in 2025, we as the private sector will deliver you $8 million worth of income tax and sales tax. It, very simple, $4 million in, $8 million out. And, and quickly people were able to say, and wait a minute, and the product becomes middle income housing. Well, if we start helping people understand those return metrics of invest and harvest and dedicate, then programs can grow over time um, and they can really become uh, the fuel uh, to actually make the ecosystem work. Thanks. I wonder if there's any, so we've kind of um, cast doubt on telework as a uh, VMT strategy, or at least pointed out some of the maybe unappreciated uh, downsides to it. I wonder if there's anybody who has a different view and is really wants to push that as a, a policy. I mean, something that's happening anyway, so it almost doesn't really need policy support, but um, somebody who wants to make a case that it's a, um, you know, really a benefit that we should be, you know, promoting to the extent it needs it. Maybe everybody's, you know, convinced. I don't know. I would say that, that um, I, I would like to make sure there's some distinction in the concept of teleworking um, in the sense that, you know, uh, do, does that mean that, hey, I'm going to work from 7 to 10 at home and then I'm going to drive to work from 10 to 2? And then I'm going to go pick up my kid. Is that can still considered teleworking or is that a hybrid model or what are we going to call that? Because I do think that um, it, not everyone's going to be in this absolutes. Um, and so maybe I just go in for three meetings that are clustered um, kind of midday. Um, and I, I, I think that that to us, that's still going to require that office buildings have to be flexible in order to be able to do that. But it also makes sure it also requires that our infrastructure has to be flexible to be able to handle that as well. Great point, and it, our work-life balance may become even more unbalanced as we're like 
uh, well, it already has. You can do Zoom calls, you know, in every time zone, you know, starting as soon as you want to wake up until you want to go to bed. So, okay. yeah, it's not all nine to five. Well, I, I had another question for Jair, and please, people do jump in. Um, um, you had just, in your talk, you had talked about designing smart ecosystems, and we just talked about some of that. But, um, and, you know, the, the flexibility needed in the planning and the coordination with transportation and so forth. Are there other, like, quick wins that we can get that you see? Are there things that, like, here in Madison, as I mentioned, we've been struggling to do first floor retail, mixed use, um, you know, um, you know, all these things. We celebrated Minneapolis for trying to do away with single family housing, all these things before COVID. Um, is that playbook, how much of that is still legit and how much of it needs to be rethought, do you think? All the sort of big policy goals you guys, which are aligned to what you guys do in Locust too. So where do you see the, the big uh, changes need to be in, in that direction? I think that there's just a couple little tweaks that I think everyone everyone needs to get on a common language of place, but everyone also needs to get a common language of data and economics and that, that basic concept of investment and return. And I think we've we've we have often fallen in love with some big planning ideas that aren't don't have a regulator on it. At one point or another, there might have been a real reason because of a retail imbalance in order to put retail on the first floor of some buildings. But instead it's put in a comprehensive, comprehensive plan that lasts for 10 years and it's gonna be in every building. <laughs> and when you were supposed to, you know, for that market, you were supposed to produce 150,000 square feet of retail, which could have been 10,000 square feet in 15 buildings. You end up at the 50th building and you're over retail. And you're saying, like, what happened? Well. The, the comprehensive plan said I had to put retail in the first floor. No, no analysis of the economics or the market. We're going back to the data that says, wait a minute, the last three restaurants failed in the last three buildings. Why are we building, new, why are we building more retail? And that's to me where the, the, the alignment of the uh, different agencies, the, the, the compression of comprehensive plans down to 10, 10 months instead of 10 years, then you start to get real-time reaction. We have the ability to do that now. And I, and I, and I look to the real estate uh, industry, but I also look to the planning uh, industry as well, that, that they have to be able to react. And, and frankly, um, how else are you gonna be able to, to, um, uh, uh, to kind of allow for our political system to be working on two and four year cycles, our comprehensive plans working on 10? I think we have to inverse it so that even our politicians have to be accountable to the production that needs to be, needs to happen and make the ecosystems work. I'll just say from hard experience that a lot of that is the staff people get all that. Um, we still have stakeholders who are, um, you know, may still remember the previous 10 years comp plan and they really put a lot of work into that. And um, also remember that, uh, you know, 20 years ago, there was a grocery store in my corner and I'm still waiting for that to come back. So I, so I, I would just throw that out as it's, in my experience, that's the tougher hill is to meet stakeholder expectations um, about what, what the built environment should look like. That's right. No, it's, 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 these aren't easy conversations, but I think Laura put it right. We were all of a sudden you can uh, you can expand parking uh, parking stalls into outdoor seating uh, because we knew that there was a job behind it. We, we knew that there was a restaurant either being open or closed. And I think if we actually um, uh, started to focus on whether or not the essential workers can get to, to places and they're living close to hospitals, I, I can't tell you how uh, you know hospital administrators, school administrators, and others who say that they are looking at the commute times as part of, you know, uh, a talent uh, a talent and quality um, uh, perspective because uh, they just can't get the best talent anymore. Great. Thank you. That, this has been great. I, it feels like maybe we've, um, you know, we're going long in the tooth for a Zoom meeting. It's been excellent. I want to see if anybody's just been sitting on a thought or question, a 
provocative argument statement that uh, for the good of the body, or if our presenters have anything that has come to them as we've been talking that you didn't get in before. I just put something in the chat for those who are working for DOTs on the call. We've, we've really spent the entire time talking about how non-work trips are dominating our system and are likely to dominate going forward and actually dominated even before this, but um, because uh, that was peak travel, it was, you know, near 100% of, uh, you know, our, our focus. I'm wondering how folks are thinking about retooling their own programs to organize around that non-work trip, if that's really, you know, if, if it's going to be such a overwhelming majority of travel going forward, what does it mean for our planning and our measurements and, and our um, idea of what a functional system is? Anybody from a DOT want to try to address that? I'm just going to hit you again in our meeting tomorrow. Warning. Yeah. Yeah, Garrett, please. Hi. Yeah, uh, Garrett Ugolito from Connecticut DOT. So um, uh, one thing that, you know, we are analyzing all of our uh, data on, on trip, um, mainly our continuous count stations are located on the highways. Um, we use other sources um, for non-interstate data, but you know, we're trying, we're struggling with that very question, Beth, and trying to figure out what it means for us. We, we were so dependent on um, uh, commuter rail and our commuter rail system is down to only having around 10 to 15% of its ridership back, but our average uh, trips on the interstates uh, that are comparable and in the same corridor are back up to pre-pandemic levels on average uh, trips being taken. So we are trying to figure out what exactly that means for us as we enter into our next five-year capital phase, um, but we also are struggling with uh, not having any money as it is. So that's forcing that same question at the same time as we're having to retool how we think about what trips we're focusing on. How do we also accommodate much less revenue coming in due to um, plummeted oil prices? So a lot of other f factors weighing in, but it's forcing a, a, a big, uh, um, uh, use the phrase, come to Jesus moment here in our, our state DOT. <laughs> Yeah, I'm also interested in what people are, you know, a lot of these non-work trips are very short distance trips and might not be captured by our models at all because they might not go between TAZs. Are we at all capable of capturing their existence, much less designing a system around trips that, you know, fall beneath our view because of the way we have measured transportation? And maybe that's just a question for the ages right now. Uh, that's, it. That, that's a good point. I, that's exactly what I asked our team uh, to start thinking about last week as we are on uh, version five of our discussion over the past month. So. I will say when we apply big data and compare it to models, intra-TAS travel, we always find vastly in excess of what the model says. Well, I'd love to see whatever you have on that, Laura. I, it sounds like I could spend weeks just digging through your data. Sounds fun. That's what it's for. Um, well, it sounds like we have um, a nice provocative start to our call tomorrow. So I think um, I appreciate folks staying with us for uh, well over an hour. Uh, speaks to the interest in this conversation. Um, sound like a politician telling you to go to joebiden.com, but ssti.us has the link for the subsequent um, sessions. Um, hope that you will join us again. Uh, and CEOs uh, who are joining us tomorrow, we're going to, Beth and I are kind of finalize a quick agenda and send that out to you today. Um, so you'll, you'll know what to expect tomorrow when we get together. 
Um, so once again, thank you very much. And um, thanks again to our speakers, Jair and Laura. Fantastic job. Um, and I think that we are adjourned. Thank Take you. Take care, everybody. <laughs>